Today, we're putting a modern spin on an old school construction method by building a hopefully next generation cross gantry printer with a wooden laser cut frame. It's like if the Annex K3 was designed in 2011. Let's get started. Aluminum extrusions and 3D printed parts have long been the gold standard for DIY 3D printers, but lately we've seen bleeding edge builds take a very different approach. Take a look at Angel. It's a cross gantry printer with 8 XY motors and a stainless steel halo that all of the gantry components mount to. Using a halo like this actually makes a lot of sense. You can very accurately machine holes into the surface to make sure that everything on the gantry is perfectly aligned. They're also, at least theoretically, completely flat. More recently, Rolahan showed off a custom printer using a similar design approach, with the gantry being bolted between two laser cut plates. Instead of using metal, Rolo is using G10, a type of fiberglass composite material for prototyping. This got me thinking about what kind of materials I could cut at home, and wood was the obvious choice. Just recently, I was asked if I'd be interested in reviewing the Creality Falcon 2 Pro laser cutter, and now I finally have a suitable project for it. Let's take it out of the box. Unboxing and setting up the machine was super easy with the included instructions. The Falcon 2 Pro is sold in three different configurations, a 22 watt diode, a 40 watt diode, and a 60 watt diode. The one I have here is the 40 watt version. Although Creality does also include a separate 1.6 watt diode used for engraving wood, as they claim that the 40 watt is too powerful to do that. They also included some different materials for me to use, there were some 3mm thick wooden sheets in both 200 and 300mm sizes, as well as a whole host of different colors of acrylic. You can definitely see that this machine was built with cutting in mind, as it even includes a pump or an air assist, which is essentially a requirement for getting clean looking cuts. The air assist will also keep the lens of the laser clean from all the dust and smoke that's kicked up by burning materials, so it's really a win-win. Creality also sent me this rotary axis, which is used for engraving on round surfaces like water bottles, rolling pins, you know, round stuff. I honestly can't think of a use for this just yet, but I'm sure something will arise eventually. If you have any suggestions, feel free to leave a comment. If you've watched my videos before, you probably know that I have a nasty habit of starting projects without finishing them, and unfortunately this video is going to be no different. Unlike normal though, this time it's not entirely my fault, so please bear with me. You see, shipping has been a bit of an uphill battle for me as soon as I moved out to the middle of nowhere. Back in April and May, I could still order via sites like Amazon and AliExpress and just have everything shipped to a P.O. box in the nearest town for me to pick up later, and I had to do that since I don't get deliveries to my front door. For reasons I don't fully understand, in late May I received many, many emails informing me that all of my in-progress orders were being cancelled because of a Canada Post strike since my P.O. box is exclusively serviced by Canada Post. Now, it's been a month since then, and despite a strike never actually occurring, I still can't order anything. So for the time being, I'm stuck with what I have available here. As a result, the scope of this video is going to be changing a bit. For the printer itself, I ended up using a concept by DK, which was based on Rolohan's design, rather than using Rolos directly. The reason for this was purely because the hardware I had laying around was better suited for DK's cross. DK's cross also uses 200mm rails, which is convenient because I can reuse some of my rails off the old rook. We won't get a whole printer, but finishing the gantry is looking doable. All of the laser cut parts are going to be cut out of these 300mm sheets. The parts themselves are a little over 280mm, so I don't have much margin for error with these cuts. All of the printed parts are going to be printed out of this eSun wood PLA, just because it goes with the theme. Cutting wood releases an awful lot of smoke, so it's very important to have a good ventilation setup. The Falcon 2 Pro has a very nice exhaust fan with more than enough pressure to vent the smoke out of the included hose. The only problem is that the hose isn't quite long enough to reach anywhere useful for me. I considered just putting the laser outside, but with the next few days supposed to be rainy, I compromised. The laser will live here on a folding table with all of the smoke being ducted outside. For software, I'm going to be using Lightburn. Now, this is paid software, but it's something that I already feel comfortable using since I use it for my other lasers back home. They also have a great 30-day free trial if you wanted to just try it out without having to pay. Converting the CAD to a path that the laser can cut is actually extremely easy. In Fusion, we'll just hit Create Sketch, then click on the face that we want to cut out, select that face, and hit Finish Sketch. 
From there, we can find the sketch that we just created under, well, sketches. And then we can just right click and hit export DXF. Just drag that file into Lightburn and now we're ready to cut. Let's add a sheet of wood and get started on the cut. Creality has some very helpful references for the settings that you should use for engraving and cutting different materials. For cutting three millimeter thick wood, this says we should use 100% power and a speed of around 750 millimeters per minute. I have my light burn configured to use millimeters per second, so 750 millimeters per minute is gonna be 12.5 millimeters per second. Next up, we need to focus the laser. This was my first time using a fixed focus laser, and I must say that I really like how simple the workflow is. Rather than needing to finely adjust a knob on the laser itself, you just loosen the whole laser and set the distance between the laser and the workpiece. The distance you choose depends on its thickness. Since we're using three millimeter thick material, we want the laser resting on this part here. Then we just tighten the laser back down and we're done. Simple as that. There's only one last thing we need to do, and that's to align the workpiece with the DXF in Lightburn. I'm pleased to report that Creality has made this process super easy as well, thanks to the camera mounted at the top of the laser. Now, this does take a little bit of work to get calibrated, but once it's done, you'll be able to accurately align your cuts in just seconds. As long as everything is squarely inside our workpiece on the camera, we know it's good to go. Admittedly, for larger parts like these, it's pretty easy to just align by eye without the camera, but if you were trying to engrave intricate details on smaller objects like coasters or keychains, then the camera could be an absolute game changer. That's enough talking, let's get making. All of the laser cuts were going well. It took just around four minutes to cut out each plate, and we need three plates for the final printer. I'm gonna save this extra material in the center, and I'll use it for the build plate later on. Now, I don't expect to keep this printer with a wooden frame forever. I'm actually really curious to try out the normal version with all of the metal parts. Whenever I start on that, I'll get it cut by the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. In addition to the high quality PCBs they're known for, PCBWay also offers fast, affordable, and high quality laser cutting services. I've used their services in the past for the bed of my Ender 3 and was blown away by its quality. Right now is a great time to try them out as they're currently celebrating their 11th anniversary with exclusive coupons. If you've got a project that needs high quality cuts and a pro finish, check out PCBWay using the link below. While the cutting was going smoothly, the printing, eh, not so much. This wood PLA was an absolute nightmare to work with. It was extremely stringy, as you can see, and would also get stuck on the nozzle and mess up the Z offset calibration. So my first layers were terrible. I tried to fix things by tweaking the retraction settings, the nozzle temperature, and even slicing plates by object so that the tool head wouldn't need to travel between different parts constantly. In the end, this worked better, but the results were still basically unusable. I decided to just switch to regular PLA instead and save myself the headache. Rather than using extrusions like in the stock CAD, I wanted to make my frame 100% wood for this video. My original plan was just to buy some 20mm square wooden dowels and use those, but I realized that the laser could help me with that too. I went to the hardware store and bought some 3 quarter inch or approximately 20mm thick wood and then cut that down to fit into the laser. Creality advertises that this thing can cut 20mm thick wood in a single pass. And now we're gonna put that to the test. I'm cutting out 10 205 millimeter long dowels at 100% power and just 1.5 millimeters per second. The recommended settings only went up to 15 millimeter thick material, so I had to sort of guess on the speed. Let's refocus the laser and then fire this off and see how it goes. I honestly had no idea a diode laser could cut so well. In fairness, my other diode laser is only about one-tenth the power of this one though. Not only did the cut go all the way through, but it was nice and clean thanks to the air assist. I did give the finished dowels a light sanding and a good wipe down with some paper towel just to get all that soot off. Meanwhile, I was just finishing up printing the last of the gantry parts. With everything ready to go, we can finally start assembling the printer. I printed some jigs to help align everything when I screw it all together. 
screwing everything together went okay, although it was definitely more effort than just using extrusions for the verticals. I had my sister to help me with the first few dowels, and from there I could hold it all together myself. The final frame looks like this. Before we install the gantry rails, we need to clean them and properly grease them. Cleaning the rails was easy enough, I just brought them inside and soaked them in a bath of isopropyl alcohol. Something like mineral spirits would be a better choice to clean rails, but this still did a decent job. Once dried, I applied a generous amount of EP2 grease and our rails were good to go. Now we can attach them to the frame. On the metal version, this middle plate would have the holes tapped with an M3 thread, but I'm just using nuts on the other side of the plate here. This was a bit tedious, but in the end, everything did come together all right. I designed and printed a quick little jig to help me install the rails parallel. I'm not sure how much it helped, but better safe than sorry. Once the bottom and middle plates were secured together, it was time to add the top plate with the four block spacers. I could attach the top plate, making sure that the bearings for double shear support were installed as well. These bearings were press fit directly into the laser cut parts, and all of the tolerances were perfect. To keep the center of gravity down, all of the XY motors are located at the bottom of the frame. I'm using LDO 1684 motors as they're the only ones that I have a set of four of at the moment, although I did need to steal two of them off of Cappy. Once the motors are mounted to the bottom, we can slide the 5mm shafts down from the top and connect them to the motor shafts with some couplers. My shafts were 300mm long, so before installing them, I cut them down a bit with a hacksaw. After installing them, I realized they were still a bit too long, so I marked each of the ends and cut them down once more. When installing the shafts for real, you also need to slide on a toothed idler and a pulley. Depending on the corner, the pulley is either on the bottom facing up or on the top facing down. The idler is always placed opposite of the pulley. A setup like this isn't optimal for performance since there's no way to support live shaft idlers, but it is extremely space efficient. Let's face it, with a wooden frame, we probably have bigger issues to worry about anyways. Next up, we need to cut out some backers for the cross rails. Here we're going to be using the same material as the rest of the frame. Same deal as with the gantry rails here, these are secured with M3 nuts on the other side. To assemble the gantry, you need the printed belt tensioners, some spacers, and of course, the cross rails as well. On one side, the order goes backer, then spacer, then belt tensioner. And on the other side, it goes spacer, using a much thinner spacer this time, then belt tensioner, then backer. I'm using some extra spacers on the very top, just so that I can use the same length screws for each XY joint. As you can see here, everything moves as intended without binding, which is just what we want to see. My biggest worry with a design like this is that the 3mm wood would be warped and everything would just bind up. It seems like the wood frame is conforming to the linear rails though, which has actually made this work better than I initially expected. There you have it folks, while there is still a lot left to do to make this print, we have the beginnings of a very unique machine. If you want to see me finish this machine with a proper z-axis, a tool head, and all of the electronics, please let me know. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.